I am about to unveil the secret source of crafting heart-pounding expositions. Prepare to create unforgettable characters, paint vivid settings, and unleash a storm of action so captivating, even your morning cereal will be jealous of the attention it gets. Everything you need to easily pass English ATAR. English ATAR made simple. Powered by Saints Coaching. Beautiful. We're talking about writing the beginning part of your short story, the exposition. The lesson after this one is about writing the middle part of your story, the background section, the rising action section, and the climax section. The lesson after that one is about the end part of your short story, the resolution. That's what's coming up in the future. Let's fast forward to the past for one moment. Make sure you have watched the previous two lessons and completed their related activities. The same thing goes for the first lesson in this module, Intro to Module 5. You got to complete that one before doing anything else in this module. Let's take a look at what we're doing in this lesson. Objective number one, first part of the lesson, recap how to formulate the title. Next part of the lesson, recap the structure of the exposition. After that, we'll analyze example one. Then we will analyze example two. We will wrap it up with a summary of the simple variety. Good one. Thanks. Let's get on with the show. How to formulate the title. Recap. This is what the relevant part of the story looks like. Wow, how interesting. The title should hint at or refer to any combination of the following aspects of your story. Number one is theme or idea. Recall our discussion of this example from the lesson on structure two lessons ago. The word unchained in this movie's title, Django Unchained, hints at Django's emancipation, his becoming a free man, and the theme of freedom. Another aspect of the story or title could refer to as a character. Our example in relation to this aspect of the story was Captain Marvel. The name of the movie is the name of the protagonist in that movie. The third aspect of your story the title can refer to is a plot point of the story. Relevant example, good old The Dark Knight Rises. Batman, The Dark Knight, literally rises from this pit. Nice and easy, that is our recap of the title and how to formulate it. Let's move on to another recap of the structure of our exposition. This is the relevant part of the inverted claw short story structure that we're focusing on today. The exposition section is the only section that is in the beginning part of our story. In the exposition, there are three elements or ingredients. One of those ingredients is characters, as alluded to in the intro to this video. Here we use conventions of characterization to introduce the protagonist, antagonist, and any other characters such as the protagonist guide or sidekick. Another element of the exposition is the setting. Our job here is to utilize aspects of setting, time, place, and mood to construct a world that complements the plot. The next and final ingredient of the exposition is the action. This is where we illustrate the relationship between the characters and the setting and ensure the reader knows exactly what the protagonist wants to achieve. In other words, we know exactly what the protagonist's mission is. Those are the elements of the exposition section of our story. The overarching purpose of this section is as follows. Immediately capture the audience's attention by starting in media res which is Latin for in the middle of the action. Fantastic. Let's move to example one. The question for this example, create a text in a particular genre that explores an idea represented in this image. This image is wow. originally used in the 2019 waste exam. Before we take a look at the title and exposition, here is a little recap of step six of the planning steps we did for this example in the previous lesson. This one. Pause this video lesson, read the underlined elements of this part of the plan, please. And we have made it to the title and exposition. Here is the complete two quick notes before we look at the deconstructed version. Firstly, unlike other text types, the ingredients, the elements of a short story don't to be in any particular order, as we've already discussed in the structure lesson. For that reason, we're not going to be seeing this color coding of these elements that we've seen in other lessons for different text types. The second note is the length of these sample responses that we'll be analyzing over this lesson and the next 
are probably 10 to 30% longer than you would be able to write in an exam. Very good. This is the title of the story about time. No, I just realized I've been using the wrong microphone for the entire lesson. I've been using my MacBook speakers instead of the actual microphone speakers. Sublime. Let's continue. The title is about time. This is the exposition. Neil, a jolt and look up from my monitor screen to see one irate Jessica Pierce standing in my office doorway, arms crossed as usual. She's wearing her favorite black belt with the capitalized gold letters GG on the buckle over her blush pink power suit. I open my mouth, utter the huh syllable of hello and I need the Douglas memo on my desk by 7 p.m. tonight and the research on false imprisonment by the end of Friday. Jessica demands before I get a chance to utter the second syllable. And regarding the latter, let's not fuck up the formatting this time, okay? She adds with the unblinking stare and contrived smile that I've come to detest over the past eight years. Absolutely, it won't happen again. I reluctantly concede. Oh, just quickly, if I have the Douglas memo on your desk by 6.30 p.m. tonight, may I leave early? My wife has the contrived smirk returns. What about your billables, Neil? Don't think I didn't notice the 58.5 hours you logged last week. You're not going to make up the remaining 90 minutes this week by leaving 30 minutes early, are you? But, and she's gone. Into the bullpen and the flurry of inquiries from paralegals that such a venture entails. I look down at my desk and see the pile of fingernails I unknowingly created during my conversation with Jessica. And below the desktop, my right leg twitching. Again, Dr. Goldberg tells Hannah and me it's called restless leg syndrome. Wonderful. It's not even 8am on a Monday morning and she's already managed to stoke my anxiety. And on today of all days. That's the title and exposition of example one. Here are some comments. Firstly, in relation to the title, about time refers to a theme of the story and a major plot point of it, as we will see in the resolution section later. Importantly, the title immediately tells the marker, my story will explore an idea represented in this image. The salience of the 24 hour time in this image and the mention of time in my title tells the marker I can see a connection between what the question is asking me to do very overtly. As we know, one of the elements of the exposition is the character's element. Element. We've got two or three characters in our story. The most important one is the protagonist, and my protagonist in this story is Neil. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about Neil? Neil, remember those conventions of characterization from module two? This relates to a reaction of another character. In this story, it's Jessica Pierce towards this character, Neil. The letters are capitalized. It creates a frantic tone as though someone is shouting. This is how this Jessica Pierce person treats our protagonist, Neil. Ultimately, forming a slightly clearer picture of this character. The word jolt is a behavior. Smirk that I've come to detest over the past eight years. This could fall under behavior, narratorial commentary, or the character's thoughts. Absolutely, it won't happen again. This is the character's dialogue. And the protagonist's dialogue in this example indicates that he's a fairly passive, maybe submissive person. But, and then the dash is used to indicate that this dialogue is being cut off. If he's being cut off, that suggests that the person who is cutting him off maybe doesn't have enough respect for Neil or doesn't have the best social conversational etiquette. The pile of fingernails part of this exposition could come under narratorial commentary. The protagonist is the narrator, but because the protagonist isn't speaking here, it defaults to becoming narratorial commentary. But the main convention of characterization this example falls under is a behavior of the protagonist. The habit of biting one's nails or picking one's nails is normally indicative of anxiety, not necessarily in the clinical sense, but just in the everyday sort of sense. Therefore, the fact that this character has that habit gives us a slightly clearer picture of what this person is all about. Another example of that is restless leg syndrome. This is narratorial commentary and a behavior once again. The pile of fingernails and the restless leg syndrome, the constant shaking legs, is painting a pretty clear picture of who this character is now. He's either stressed or anxious or both. It's not that great. On top of all of that, we've finally got this explicit admission of this character's anxiety. She's already managed to stoke my anxiety and on today of all days. Stoke means to ignite or flare up, make the flame bigger. 
So that is Neil, the protagonist. Then we turn to the next character of our story, the antagonist, the villain, who is Jessica. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about Jessica? Neil, dialogue. One, I rate Jessica Pierce. Two relevant conventions here, the character's name, Jessica Pierce, and narratorial commentary coming from our protagonist. Arms crossed, as usual. Relevant convention, body language. Favorite black belt with capitalized gold letters GG on the buckle over her blush pink power suit. Relevant convention, physical appearance. Let's not fuck up the formatting this time, okay? Convention is dialogue. Unblinking stare and contrived smile. Conventions are narratorial commentary from the protagonist himself and physical appearance of this antagonist. Next, don't think I didn't notice the 58.5 hours you logged last week. That convention is the dialogue of Jessica Pierce. To summarize, those excerpts tell us that Jessica Pierce is tyrannical. She's a tyrant. She likes to wear expensive clothes, and she is demanding and rude to Neil. That is our antagonist of the story, About Time. This is the third and final character, Neil's guide or sidekick, Hannah. What do these excerpts tell the reader about Hannah? My wife has, and then Neil is cut off by Jessica. Dr. Goldberg tells Hannah and me it's called restless leg syndrome. These two excerpts don't explicitly say that Hannah is Neil's wife, but it has a strong implication that that is the case. That's the character element or ingredient of the exposition. Here's the setting element. We got three aspects of setting. First one is time. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about time? Look up from my monitor screen. Black belt with the capitalized gold letters GG on the buckle over her blush pink power suit. Those two excerpts tell the reader the period is roughly the present day, the 2020s. People didn't really have big monitor screens 20 years ago. The Gucci belt is a relatively recent thing, and it's more common to see power suits nowadays than, say, 50, 60 years ago. If I wanted to tell the reader the story setting is contemporary, writing I jolt and look up from my monitor screen is probably better than I jolt and look up from my notepad. It's not even 8am on a Monday morning. This third excerpt explicitly tells the reader what the specific time is, whereas the previous two excerpts tell the reader what the general time is, the general era. That's the time aspect of setting. This is the place aspect. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about place? Jessica Pierce standing in my office doorway. Douglas memo. Research on false imprisonment. What about your billables? Into the bullpen and the flurry of inquiries from paralegals that such a venture entails. It's pretty clear from those excerpts that the place is a law firm. Notice how legal jargon was used to convey that fact to the reader without explicitly saying this is a law firm. Third and final aspect of setting is mood. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about mood? I jolt. One, I rate Jessica Pierce. Let's not fuck up the formatting this time, okay? Don't think I didn't notice the 58.5 hours you logged last week. You're not going to make up for the remaining 90 this week by leaving 30 minutes early, are you? Into the bullpen and the flurry of inquiries from paralegals. The pile of fingernails. Restless leg syndrome. Stoke my anxiety. After identifying these aspects of the text, I think it's fair to say the mood is tense. Third and final ingredient of the exposition is the action. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about the protagonist's mission? Oh, just quickly, if I have the Douglas memo on your desk by 6.30 tonight, may I leave early? My wife has, but she's already managed to stoke my anxiety and on today of all days. From those excerpts, we can tell that Neil wants to leave work early because of something to do with his wife. But the specifics of why he wants to leave early aren't disclosed yet. As we just saw, there are two occasions where Neil tries to tell Jessica why he wants to leave early, but Jessica interrupted him both times before he got a chance to finish. These two interactions create some suspense and foreshadow some precise details about the protagonist's mission. Ultimately, doing all of that stuff entices the reader to continue reading. Okay, that is all I wanted to say about the exposition for example one. Let's take a look at the exposition for example two. Create an imaginative text with a central voice that conveys hope or redemption. 2017 Waste Exam Section 3, Question 10. Step 6 of the planning steps, recapped. Here they are. Have a quick skim of the following underlined elements. And let's take a look at the title and exposition. Here is the complete version of it. Here's the deconstructed version. The title is Simon Says. Moving to the exposition. 
48, the guard yells. His right jacket sleeve has the letters SS on them. Dad says that it stands for Simon Says and that we're going to be playing a big game where everyone's got a number and whenever Simon calls your number, you have to do whatever Simon says, otherwise you lose the game. Yes, sir, I say. 49, Simon says. Yes, sir, Dad says. Simon continues walking down the single file of players, I suppose that'd be about 400 of us, calling out each one's number to make sure they're not missing out on the game. I think this is one of the longest and weirdest games I've played. It's been going on for about a week or so. It's hard to keep track of time in the game because everyone's wristwatch was taken away before we started it. And dad still hasn't told me how to win. In good time, Charlie, he keeps saying when Simon isn't around. Dad says that we can't use our real names when we're in the game because that's against the rules and we'll lose the game. Dad also hasn't told me what happens if you lose the game either. 74, Simon says. Yes, says a voice that sounds like someone around my age. This is normally what happens at the beginning of each day. We all stand in one long, long line and wait for Simon to make sure all the players are here before we get our bit of bread and soup for the day. I asked dad why the bread was so stale and the soup was so watery. He just said it's because Simon doesn't make it easy for people to win the game, whatever that means. 106, Simon says. Charlie, dad whispers from behind me. You see lots of people I want past the troughs and the lights. Yeah? I say, squinting at the fence over yonder. Tell you. Ooh. That is the title and exposition for Simon Says. Let's discuss some comments. The title is Simon Says. This title refers to a bunch of things. Firstly, a theme of the story, which is Hitler's oppressive dictatorship. What Hitler says, everyone does. Secondly, this title refers to a character. In other words, Charlie refers to every SS guard as Simon. Thirdly, this title refers to a plot point. The dialogue tag Simon Says is used throughout the whole story. It's sprinkled over the plot. Obviously, the story's title is also the name of a popular kids game, whereby players must obey all commands that begin with the words Simon Says. That is our title. This is one of the elements or ingredients of the exposition section, the characters. Our protagonist is Charlie. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about Charlie? 48, the guard yells. Yes, sir, I say. Relevant convention here is dialogue. Historically speaking, referring to a person by a number has never been very reassuring. There are no exceptions to this. His right jacket sleeve has the letters SS on them. Dad says it stands for Simon Says. We're going to be playing a big game where everyone's got a number and whenever Simon calls your number, you have to do what Simon says, otherwise you lose the game. Relevant convention of characterization here is the character's thoughts. Also, SS is an abbreviation of the German word Schutzstaffel, which was a major paramilitary organization founded by Hitler that was responsible for the genocide of approximately 6 million Jews. The fact that this protagonist believes his dad that SS stands stands for Simon Says, tells the audience he's naive, young, innocent, etc. I think this is one of the longest and weirdest games I've played. The convention is characters' thoughts. Those thoughts are telling us that the protagonist knows something is different about this game, but isn't mature enough to comprehend the situation entirely, to fully see the fact that he is in an inhumane environment. Dad still hasn't told me how to win. Nothing fancy about this, really it's just telling the reader that the protagonist, like most young kids, just wants to win the game. It also gives us a little hint, it foreshadows what Charlie's mission is. In good time, Charlie. He, dad, keeps saying when Simon isn't around. This sentence tells the reader what the protagonist's real name is, which personalizes him. Names are such a fundamental part of a person's identity and it helps the reader associate an identity to the person that we're reading about. The next type of character is the antagonist and the antagonist in our story is Simon. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about Simon? His right jacket sleeve has the letters SS on them. Relevant convention, physical appearance. Whenever Simon calls your number, you have to do what Simon says. This is an instance of narratorial commentary from our protagonist, Charlie. Yes, sir, I say. Charlie calling Simon sir is a reaction to this character of Simon. And the word sir is a very respectful term. It's pretty traditional. Sometimes it can imply subservience to someone who is considered a superior. Simon doesn't make it easy for people to win the game. In short, those excerpts tell us that Simon is a nondescript and authoritative guard who is a member of the Schutzstaffel. 
Okay, we've done the protagonist, we've done the antagonist. Now let's turn to the third and final character, Charlie's dad, who is the guide slash sidekick. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about dad? Dad said it stands for Simon Says and that we're going to be playing a big game. Relevant, convention, narratorial commentary. You see that fence up ahead of you? The one past the food troughs and the huts? That's how you win the game. Relevant, convention, dialogue. These excerpts tell us that Charlie's dad is loving and thoughtful. He wants to make the experience of being in a concentration camp as tolerable as possible for his young son. And he does that by telling him it's a game that Charlie can win. Also, Charlie's dad inspires Charlie to be hopeful, which addresses the central voice that conveys hope part of the question. That's all I wanted to say about the character's ingredient of this exposition. Let's turn to the setting element. We've got three aspects of setting. One of them is time. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about time? The letters SS. It's hard to keep track of time in the game because everyone's wristwatch was taken away before we started it. Those brief excerpts give clear insights into the time period of the story. The Schutzstaffel was in power during World War II, and World War II lasted from 1939 to 1945. There is no mention of any technology other than a wristwatch to tell the time, which further supports this implication that the time is World War II. Another aspect of setting is place. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about the place? Simon continues walking down the single file of players. I suppose there'd be about 400 of us. Make sure all the players are here before we get our bit of bread and soup for the day. I asked dad why the bread was so stale and the soup was so watery. You see that fence up ahead of you? The one past the food troughs and the huts? Once again, these excerpts don't explicitly tell us what the place is, but they give us enough to feed our imagination. From those excerpts, we can infer the following. The place must be large enough to fit about 400 people lined up up in single file. Players are underfed and treated poorly, and players are seemingly fenced in and trapped. All of that is to say, readers can intuit, can guess that Charlie is in a concentration camp. Third and final aspect of setting is mood. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about mood? You have to do what Simon says, otherwise you lose the game. The bread was so stale and the soup was so watery. Simon doesn't make it easy for people to win the game. So from those excerpts, we might conclude the mood, the feeling created by the text is as follows. Gloomy, concerning, depressing, distressing, harrowing, etc. Don't forget to revisit the lesson on mood for a bunch of adjectives you can use to describe it. Beautiful work. We've done the characters element. We've done the setting element. Let's move to the final element of the exposition, the action. What do the following excerpts tell the reader about the protagonist's mission? Otherwise you lose the game. Dad still hasn't told me how to win. Dad also hasn't told me what happens if you lose the game either. You see that fence up ahead of you? The one past the food troughs and the huts? That's how you win the game. Finally, we can tell from those excerpts that the protagonist's mission is to escape from the concentration camp. Also, the reader knows that Charlie, our protagonist, is too naive to understand that losing the game is a euphemism for being killed. On that high note, that's all the main content of the lesson. Let's do a simple summary. I'm waiting for a TikTok to load. 96%. It's probably going to start playing just as I start speaking and I will be interrupted. The show must go on. Simple summary, how to formulate the title, recap. Your title should allude to one or more of the following aspects of your story. A theme or idea, a character, and or a plot point. We then move to a recap of the structure of the exposition. Ah, we did it. Whoa, this is meta. You're looking at me on a screen while I'm looking at me on a screen, looking at me on a screen. The overarching purpose of the exposition is to captivate the audience by starting in media res, in the middle of the action. One element or ingredient of the exposition is characters, and here we should use conventions of characterization to introduce the protagonist, the antagonist, and any other characters, such as the protagonist guide or sidekick. Another element of the exposition is the setting. This is where we utilize aspects of setting, time, place, and mood to construct a world that complements the plot. Last element of the exposition is the action, 
This is where we illustrate the relationship between the characters and the setting and ensure the reader knows what the protagonist wants to achieve, i.e. what the protagonist's mission is. After that, we looked at example one and example two. This is some stuff to bear in mind in relation to how to formulate the title and those different elements of the exposition. Starting with the title, aim to construct a simple title with multiple layers of meaning. Example, about time simply refers to the image the question is based on and the phrase it's about time and suggests the story will be about the concept of time. Second example, Simon Says refers to the children's game and its dictatorial nature. The dialogue tag used for the character of Simon and it shares the same acronym as Schutzstaffel. Another ingredient of the exposition is characters. It's a good idea to give your characters idiosyncrasies, traits that are unique to them, to make them more realistic. We've all got idiosyncrasies. Examples of idiosyncrasies that we saw from example one are picking nails and restless leg syndrome. Another thing in relation to characters, use a variety of conventions of characterization. Furthermore, manipulate diction and syntax to construct your desired type of narrator. Example, dad said it stands for Simon Says and that we're going to be playing a big game. That use of diction and syntax probably leads to the voice of a naive child, which is telling us that the narrator is unreliable and probably the knife. Another example, and she's gone, into the bullpen and the flurry of inquiries from paralegals at such a venture entails. This use of diction and syntax suggests the voice is probably that of an educated adult, which factored in with the other things we know about the narrator tells us that he's reliable. We've got a few more points about the character's element. One of those, jargon can be employed to illustrate a character's profession. In About Time, we've got the following example. I need the Douglas memo on my desk by 7 p.m. tonight and the research on false imprisonment by the end of Friday. That stuff is telling us the person is in the corporate world, probably part of our beloved legal profession. Character traits and relationships can be implied. You don't need to explicitly say, so-and-so is so-and-so's wife husband, whatever. Also, don't underestimate the connotations of a character's name. Example, Neil versus Jessica Pierce. Final point about characters, consider utilizing a nondescript antagonist to convey a character versus society conflict. Nondescript protagonist like Simon in Simon Says is implying that Simon is representative of society and in that story Charlie is up against society. Here's some important stuff regarding the setting element of the exposition. We've got three aspects of setting, one of them is time. Referring to technology and clothing is a subtle way to indicate the time aspect of setting. Examples, wristwatch versus apple watch, dress versus blush pink power suit. Another aspect of setting is place. Jargon can be employed to illustrate the place aspect of setting. Example, and she's gone into the bullpen and the flurry of inquiries from paralegals that such a venture entails. The use of legal jargon in this sentence indicates the setting is most likely a law firm. Encourage the reader to use their imagination to visualize the place by drip feeding features of it. Example, Simon continues walking down the single file of players. I suppose there'd be about 400 of us now. Last point about place, consider the connotations of words you use to describe the place. For example, you see that fence up ahead of you, the one past the food troughs and the huts. What are the connotations of food troughs and huts once we know that there are 400 people in this enclosed space? They ain't good. Final aspect of setting is mood. Consider the effect of diction, the word you use on the construction of mood. Example, jolt, irate, let's not fuck up the formatting. You have to do what Simon says, otherwise you lose the game. Our final ingredient of the exposition is the action. Foreshadowing the precise details of the protagonist's mission entices the audience to continue reading your story. Example, she has already managed to stoke my anxiety and on today of all days. Emphasize the protagonist's mission to the reader by emphasizing parts of it. Example, dad still hasn't told me how to win. What happens if you lose the game? That's how you win the game. That is it for this lesson. I'll cut straight to the chase. You gotta write expositions. Specifically, expositions for the questions you planned for, for the activities from the previous lesson. One tip, try and actually have some fun with it. I know you're probably thinking that is not going to happen. I don't blame you, but hey, you might be surprised. I was not looking forward to writing the short stories that we're looking at in these lessons, but I was honestly pleasantly surprised and actually found it pretty enjoyable. 
So with all of that nerdiness said, enjoy writing the beginnings of your stories and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, keep it simple.